Uh, so hello, guys. Um, thank you so much for coming to this little follow-up session. Um, the whole goal of this was just to kind of like actually get a little more in the weeds of how we built this thing um, and give you a little bit more um, things to put your fingers into um, in case you did not. And uh, attend the keynote. Uh, my name is Alex Guffey. I'm a UX lead for Disney Experiences Communications Technology. Our team works on internal and external websites, as well as as well as a whole host of other communications technologies for Disney Experience. So. Um, today, this particular presentation is going to be going through our own team's WordPress setup and listen. I know that the way we built this is really peculiar, um, but the way we built this was rooted really in user needs first. Um, we also didn't technically start from scratch. Um, a lot of the, a lot of what we got to and a lot of the product we ended up with was a series of decisions um, and building with what we already knew. Um, but I hope that you all can pull something for your own Gutenberg development or WordPress development. And then, quick, Let's see, I got it. <laughs> um, so once again, initiation. Um, I think this one is the most important quote for developers. You don't build it for yourself. You know what the people want and you build it for them. Um, so just a little bit of agenda up front. Um, I'm going to take you guys through um, just a quick little overview of um, who we are and what the product actually specifically was. Our WordPress build, take you through how we built our custom blocks, um, and then some little takeaways for you. All right, let's get into it. Um, so really what we... Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Sorry, have to reorient myself. Um, the the technology situation is complicated. This is kind of what you get for adopting things early. This is actually running on Figma slides, which I don't know if yeah, it, it's yeah, it's cool. We're we're trying something. I was like, I work in Figma every single day as a UX designer, and I will say that like the auto layout, nah, it was just it, it's exactly what you needed for slides, but. It's kind of weird because it's like we have the window open and then we have the speaker notes and it's not connected. So I'm sure they're working on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so let's uh, talk about our actual user for a second. Um, so the previous process for building websites and deploying these things before would be that content would be worked on and perfected for weeks, sometimes months. Like these were things that would happen in Word docs between communications professionals. It would go through director level. It would go through security level, um, that whole shebang. And then it would go to a designer and a designer would make essentially their p pixel perfect version of that design. And then it would go to a digital producer to recreate perfectly with web dev technologies. Like sometimes, <laughs> My manager, Mike, is in the audience, and there were some websites that he built in like the span of a weekend. Like it was, it was bonkers, the process we were going through before. Um, it was just the level at which we were expected to perform, and sometimes the amount of time that we had was problematic. And as we know, development is sort of what takes the longest, and we are sort of the first people that need to be brought into the process. Um, so this was just, it was just not working. Um, and then we also had the problem where our client base was just growing too large and the website demand was just too high for continuing to produce at this level. Um, so we needed to create something they could both design and build themselves without the intervention of us every single time. Um, so we had our purpose. Um, our users needed something simple to work with. But we knew that they even struggled with some of the page builders that we were using at the time. And vanilla Gutenberg blocks, as it was, already kind of posed a challenge. Um, they're not, like at the time when we were looking into them and experimenting with them, they were not the most user-friendly and there's still some problems. It's obviously a product that's still growing. Um, so we knew that our goals were, we would build a system that looked beautiful, required little to no knowledge, um, and had those best practices baked in. This was where, really where we oriented ourselves. And then, wow. Okay. Um, 
so the first goal was really kind of simplifying the complex. Um, so we enabled a few small Gutenberg blocks by default, but the vast majority in our system are actually custom. Um, once again, the number of users we support is so high and we needed something everyone can and would use. Um, so Gutenberg by default has so many options and it's pretty hard to customize. Um, so if you look, I actually have an example here and it's teeny tiny, I get it, um, but kind of the vanilla Gutenberg process and this is the query loop. So you go on the, the right hand, the left hand panel, you add a query loop, you choose, a, you click one of these bad patterns to choose or reuse, you choose a pattern, and then you have this whole long sidebar of all of these options. Um, and it's also written in terms of WordPress experts. It's written for people like us that know exactly what they're doing right out of the gate. Um, and that was really a problem we couldn't we couldn't get people to understand that. Um, so this was an example of one of our own custom blocks. Um, and once again, the process is simply, they add that, that post into the page. So this is our post automatic block. So this is what we use instead of the post query. Um, and then that right hand filter bar is kind of how all of these end up being set up. Um, so you can see, instead of having them go through this giant list, we're having them filter by right up front, most recent category, tag, and section is a custom taxonomy. Um, category gives you a drop down list that's searchable of things that already exist. We have a show read more button if that's something that they choose to do, which automatically then links to that category they just selected or that taxonomy they just selected. Um, and then we have different visual variations. So um, this, this is the three visual variations that we have for this website, uh, have for this block, you can do three column, which is the one you see in that preview image. There's a four column and there's also a slider view. Um, and when they click these, they're actually showing up live in the editor. Um, and they can change the number of posts very easily. Um, and then that visual settings I did not show. Um, that one's a little bit more of a family secret, but uh, that one is sort of all of our theming elements. So you're doing things like background colors, you're doing um, all of those like little visual elements that sort of set the whole platform apart and all of those little decisions. Um, so this is really kind of what we got to. Um, and uh, <laughs> the, the system that we're working with, um, <laughs> So why did this particularly work? Here we go. Um, so users were really attracted to the cohesive front end design, but stay for the system's simplicity and user friendliness. So though we did create a lot of, our, a lot of work for ourselves to create the system of custom blocks, we find that we, we struck this balance of um, people really love the design. There's enough options for them where they don't feel restricted. There's a lot of page building opportunities. Um, and they really get to a point where they're really empowered to actually build these websites. Cool. Um, so we're going to go into a little bit of how our system is actually structured, our whole theme. Um, so I'm going to invite up our senior developer, Katrina, to the stage. Please give her a round of applause. Hello, friends. So like she said, my name is Katrina. I'm the senior web developer on our team. Um, Alex has been a wonderful mentor. She's been a great lead. She handles most of our design choices and are user friendly. Um, but I do want to focus, like Alex said, our main purpose is design and user use and usability before all else. So everything else is secondary. Not that other things aren't important. It's just not what we focus on. It's not the runner for us. So starting off, the way we accomplish this is a little bit old school. What we do is we do a classic theme approach. This is going to give us, what we do is we take the PHP templates and we customize this. This gives a, we're able to directly modify and have full control over all of the site appearance. So we can customize multiple headers, footers, as well as templates for all the posts and pages and really fine tune the design on each page. This allows us to directly, I'm sorry, let me, let me correct myself. I'm a little nervous, you guys. I'm a developer. <laughs> yeah, y'all know what I mean. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but this gives us the ability to decide exactly what appears, 
where and when and how it appears. And because we have so many different style guides, we need to have an effect on every single aspect. We also use custom taxonomies because we have such a large range of teams with a lot of different needs. What we do is we use these taxonomies to really meet and give them all the content that they need without messing up and making sure we're all cohesive. So we're able to um, <laughs> help organize and present the content dynamically to meet everyone's needs. You're wonderful. Thank you for being so patient. <laughs> Um, to start off, I want to show you how we trickle down through our theme. So what we have is our main Aloha theme. This is going to be where all of our default CSS styles are, as well as some custom taxonomies and some reusable blocks. The quick thing about Aloha is we actually created this to be a standalone theme for Disney Connect. And we, once we built it, we quickly realized just how versatile it was. So as we were loading onto the press sites, like Alex mentions, we have different teams, different things. We put the press sites also on Disney Connect and we decided, but they have a different audience. So we wanted to give it its own custom experience. So we gave it its own custom design as well as its own taxonomies. For example, a normal audience for Disney Connect doesn't really care about things like media kits. However, that's really, really important to the press sites. So we were able to make an entire taxonomy around that and give it to the press sites while still using main Aloha's functionality. Moving on though, the parks blog. When we got the parks blog, that's a beast. We were super excited. However, it needed to be completely different than Disney Connect. We wanted it to be have its own unique design. We wanted it to be distinguishable from all the other sites. So what we did was we heavily gave it, we once again pulled down Aloha, gave it the main theme, and then we added on our unique CSS styles for it, as well as its own custom taxonomies, which was helpful for, you saw the social feed that we have. Um, we have that and we're able to break those out into different post styles, different taxonomies, and then call them so every single one of them have a different look and they're able to, we're able to control the functionality through those taxonomies. And then it also, another really cool thing about Aloha is so with the parks blog, because we needed to be distinguishable and we have all of these preset blocks, because as you can see, we make it pretty um, locked down to where all the designs kind of stay the same. The parks blog needed its own blocks, its own thing that really set it apart. And in Aloha, we are able to control what theme has each block. So we could make specific blocks that were tailored just for the parks blog and then make sure none of the other sites could have them because it didn't really fit their designs, it fit the parks blog, which is something that we're really proud of. And if you're wondering how we built a site in 60 days, this is how we built it in 60 days. We already had something that was amazing, something that we could easily use. Alex did a fantastic job making sure that we were able to really grow and do this. Um, whoops, you're not kidding. <laughs> Hmm. There we go. Um, so let's take a deep dive into our custom blocks. This is actually my favorite topic to talk about. I absolutely love our custom blocks. This is a cute little design. We saw it in the keynote, but this is a cute little design that Alex made. It shows over 50 Gutenberg blocks with our design system. And you can see how it easily just beautifully flows together with all the design. We're able to do that with theming. As you can see, there's a bunch of different backgrounds that all the matter that are all the same as well as buttons that are the same we're able to do this with massive theming to get a little into it though whoops I promise I'm technical <laughs> um, so to get into the basics of our blocks um, so even though Aloha and our blocks work so heavily together, we actually keep them separate. That's a little secret, you guys. We keep them separate. So what we do is we have our Aloha theme, right? And then we have all of our blocks and a must-use plugin. The reason we do this, even though they both need each other, the reason we do this is for debugging purposes. 
So now, because everything's growing so big, if there's an error, that's a big deal, right? So what we do is we break it down. We're able to, with just a couple of clicks, decide, is the error coming from the blocks? Is it coming from the theme? Let's hurry up and fix it. And our wonderful tech partners are able to deploy that code, fix it for us very quickly. It's not a process going through all of our code to find the issue. The next thing we use with all of our blocks is gonna be components. This is really to help reduce redundancy. We have a lot of things that we need to have the same throughout the site. We don't wanna to have to keep building it over and over. So we break as much stuff down as we can into components. We really need to do that more, you guys, but <laughs> we'll get there. Um, also, we have our dynamic block structure. So this is something I know people are having questions about. Early on, we decided to switch all of our blocks into dynamic blocks. And the reason we did this is because when we would go into a block and we would change the custom code, right? Like someone asked, it wasn't trickling through the rest of the site. And we have so much content that we don't have the ability to go back and refresh every single block and make sure every single block has that new code. So make it dynamic actually goes through and trickles all of these changes throughout our entire site. That being said, it also doesn't actually affect the database. So anytime someone's capturing the metadata, the metadata, such as like their header, their description, their different style chooses that they have, it's not going to actually erase those. It's gonna still keep those, but just update with our code and our new things. Um, as you can see also, so our file structure, I wanna point that out. Our file structure, this is what every single block looks like. You're gonna have your block.json, our edit, our index, and our render file. Um, a little overview of what these all are, I'll probably go in deeper on most of them, but our block is going to be where we initially set all of our attributes. Then we're gonna have our edit, that's gonna be what the editor sees, obviously. And then we have our index, which is just, it's just the entry point for the block. And then we have our render, which is what you're gonna see on the live site. Oh, I'm getting the hang of this. Okay, so now the parts of all of our custom blocks, all of our custom blocks are made up of multiple parts and it's pretty much all of this, give or take some, you know, there might be a couple of little weirdos in there as well. But we do have, starting off, we have all of ours with the Gutenberg elements. So these are gonna be things that are gonna be in our control panels. So such as the checkbox control, radio control, things like that. Moving on, we also have our block attributes. So that's gonna be where we set our header, our descriptions, and we can capture those throughout the site. Then we have our CSS classes. This is really important for theming. So we're able not only to just do our classes for our styles, but we're able to do use attributes. So that way, when we have a new theme, we can trickle it down through all the sites. What's really cool is not only are we using this to do it like block wise. So let's say a background color on a block. We are also being able to use a theming to trickle down the entire page to change everything in that page to match this theme as well as site-wise. So if we have huge events like D23 or a new release to a ride, we can easily go in and make an entire event page. What we would do is we would create a couple of blocks, throw some content in there, choose the styles and the theming, and then bam, bam, boom, we have a new event page. Don't tell anyone that it's that easy. <laughs> um, next, we have our WordPress queries. So with that, that is, we actually don't use that super often, but we do have our use case. For example, Alex showed our um, latest posts, our post automatic. What that's doing is just pulling in all the latest posts. It's gonna do a query loop, go through there. So that way we can get fresh content without needing to do all the manual labor that goes into keeping it fresh. We have too much content going out. We can't, keep, can't possibly keep up with all that. The next thing is our custom components. Once again, reducing redundancy. We want to be able to create a button and it look the same throughout the entire site. We don't wanna to have to keep recreating that. As well as when we have different style changes, we're able to do it in one place. And then also we have our inner blocks. So inner blocks is not to be confused with the way we use components. Components we're using so that way we're not having to redo stuff that's gonna go all through, the, all, through all the blocks, right? where our inner blocks is for repeating elements. This is gonna think, think of something like a card, right? So we can create a card and we can highly design it just the way we need to meet all of our style needs. 
And then instead of doing all that again, we just duplicate it over and over and over with inner blocks. This also allows the user to choose how many times it gets duplicated. So instead of us being like, you only get four posts, now we have that a cute little slider that lets them choose anywhere from three posts to 12 posts. They can decide how many, and I'm sure y'all have seen this across the sites. We just have it, you know, that's ours. Um, Oh, and also, we also have different functionality with this as well. So what we do is we'll use like an if-else statement to where if, we, if the user chooses to have a featured block, then what will happen is if they do that, the first card will have this style. So it'll be bigger and more beautiful. And then all the other ones will be this normal card. Or if they don't, then it's just all the normal cards, right? So this is going to be able to really diversify that. Okay, so here's an example of our edit file. Um, this is what, how a normal block would probably look, okay? So as you can see, starting off there, we have, we're bringing in some Gutenberg elements. That's gonna be things like our inspector controls, our checkbox control. Then you see the Aloha gradient shadow. That is a custom component. That is what we're creating somewhere and we wanna trickle this, radio, this box shadow all throughout. We're gonna pull it in that way. Then moving on down, you can see our attributes. Our attributes, these are us pulling those in from the um, block.json. So we can predefine them there, pull them in here. We can change these values as well as allow the user to change these values. Then we have our class names. You see a regular class name. If you're familiar with CSS, it's just the regular styles, right? But then also we have it in an attribute version. This is, once again, allows the user to choose that style and us easily put it in there, as well as once again, if we need to have site-wide theming, we can introduce those styles that way. Moving on, we have our inner block. That is how we're going to define our inner block. If you can see there, it says like aloha slash inner block example. This is because all inner blocks are its own, in, its own block. It's all going to have its own files, its own structure. And then we pull it in here and decide, hey, this is where we want to put it. So it's all going to have its own thing. And then we're just pulling it in here dynamically. Um, on the other side, you're going to have your inspector controls. This is going to handle like visual settings. So this is all the, pretty much the sidebar panel is what that's handling. So you can see the checkbox control. Once again, we have that there in our Aloha gradient. That's giving them the options to choose it. And then we have our text down at the bottom. You see that that's where they're gonna do the header. They can do any other type of text that we wanna put there. And then you can see we're calling our inner blocks with just one line. We can also put styles and stuff there as well, um, but we just don't have that as an example today. Um, here's an example of what that actually might would look like on the front end. I know you've seen this slide before, but here, let's take a closer look now that we've seen how our structure would be. So you can see that we're using the query loop to get in these latest features. We also have the most recent category tag and section. Those are us using taxonomies to be able to filter through the post query to be able to decide what all is going to show up there. Then we have, once again, we have our checkbox there and our radio. And then you see our little slider to show our inner blocks to see how many inner blocks we want to show up. Also, let's get a little closer to our render. So our render is going to be, like a, once again, it's what shows up on the front end. So we have our class that's gonna show up. Once again, our CSS attributes, yay. We can pull in dynamically what choice that they have, what choice did they choose on the front end, as well as any theming, we can pull it in right there. Then we have our, we're, set, we're showing our attributes, just straight up HTML. We're doing our attributes for the header, what they select. The cool thing about this is this is pulling in with the render, it is pulling in straight HTML. So it's doing all of the nonsense behind the scene first, and then it's delivering pure HTML to the front end. So that's going to give us, that's going to help with our loader, with our time speed, which is something that we need. So moving on. So now we have, I think this is lastly, we have our custom components. So once again, we do custom components for redundancy. Um, we're going to have some based off UI components, such as um, buttons and images, as well as visual things like theming. 
And you can see what we're doing here in this example. We are creating a radio control for a box shadow. This is going to allow us to be able to put a box shadow anywhere out their thing and not have to go and recreate it. The cool thing about this is because we are very heavily on style guides, we have a bunch of different teams, different events are gonna have different style needs and we need to stick to those design needs, right? We can go straight to these blocks and make the small change, or not the blocks, I'm sorry, components and make the small change there and it will trickle through the entire site in that one section without having to do it over and over and over and over and over. Um, and then that is everything for our technical deep dive. Alex, would you like to come take us away? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Katrina. Um, it's, I, I'm so happy that I actually got to brought, bring some of my team here. Um, and she did such a good job. I'm so proud. <laughs> um, so we, when we were building this thing, we really worked to our particular strengths. Um, we, are, we are not a DevOps team. We are not back-end focused. We are very design and front-end heavy. Um, we knew that we could easily churn out something custom here. Um, so we really put that forward when we were doing this. But we also worked to our limitations. Um, having so many u users and not being able to use much external technology. As I said, this became a um, series of decisions that were informed by previous decisions that were informed by other decisions. Part of these decisions are is we can't often use external technology. We need to get approval for things like this. Um, so because we built it in Gutenberg, it was sort of a great way forward. Um, it's really allowed us to build something custom and the build was exactly what we needed as a team, as a department, as an enterprise. Um, and that was very special. Um, but that does not mean that's how we're going to continue to build it. And it does not mean that's how we would build it from scratch if we built it today. Um, <laughs> we are so excited to grow and follow Gutenberg's future. But when we started this thing, um, Gutenberg was definitely in its infancy. And she's growing. She's learning. She's changing. And so are we. Um, so we are so excited to start now that we have this cool thing and it's working really well to start thinking about the future and growing with Gutenberg instead of growing against Gutenberg. Um, many, but much of what drove us to Gutenberg in the beginning was actually its scalability. Um, so our early WordPress sites were so in inconsistent and they created a lot of security risks and we really needed that common code base. We really needed a way to be able to control all 60 of these websites with minimal effort on our parts. Um, the further we go, the easier it is to create new blocks um, and the more that we're able to build in that scalability. But like I said, Hindsight is 2020. Um, I think there are a lot of decisions we would have made differently today than what it ended up being. All right. Um, I kind of said this in my other presentation, but just always assume that people know nothing. The people that build your website are not going to be web developers. Um, don't ask them to start from scratch. Provide as many templates as you possibly can. Um, provide training early and in diverse ways. We specifically built a system with easy usability in mind, and we're still reaching so much friction. Um, we've tried all sorts of different options. I think we're creating a video series internally to disseminate this information. Um, there was like a little nod to it on the other thing, but we have a documentation version of Aloha now um, that we're actually displaying a lot of these sort of um, have a, having a storybook style view, way to view all of our custom blocks and things like that. Um, so there's just never enough training. Just just try your best to uh, um, think about that from the get-go and the ways that you can be doing it documented as things come out. Um, and then this one is a repeat, but the end product is everything, guys. Like, they... <laughs> They did simply not care how long this thing took us. They don't care how much time it 
took, they just know that the websites are really beautiful. And yes, there is some acknowledgement that a 60 day deadline was amazing, but they still do not quite know how the sauce gets made. Um, and this is my little moment to encourage all of you that you're doing wonderful um, and that those compromises that you make sometimes are probably for the best. Um, but, uh, but I promise that it'll all come together for something lovely. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Yes, go for it. Uh, number one, are your slides available later for me to look at with a uh, closer eye? Uh, number two, there's lots of things that you would do differently if you were building them right now. What are those? Like, <laughs> do we have for, like, block templates? What's the do we have time for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first thing, organizers do, are the slides going to be available post-event? I actually don't know. I'll give them to you. I can do that. Okay. Um, would you like to take it? No, you can handle it. Okay. Um, so uh, I spoke a little bit about it in the keynote presentation. Um, it was my slide about atomic design by Brad Frost. Um, so when we built our system, patterns weren't even really a thing yet. So when we built it, we were building patterns as blocks, which is fascinating and I'm not sure that we would have done it the same way the the next time we did it um I am not sure we wouldn't have built these little things as UI components and built our UI components as blocks and then deployed those as blocks and locked down our patterns um it still was definitely a good choice in the sense that it offers us that ability to lock it down um because everything is a custom block they only have the options that are there we've We've taken away a lot of the other Gutenberg stuff, at least on the page level, not so much on the post level. Um, so I think that's one big glaring thing that would be different. Um, but then, yes, there's a whole host of other things. Like so. Well. so another thing I'd like to point out. So we have um, our enterprise partners in here somewhere. I don't, I can't find him. But he is really good at Gutenberg. And I feel like if we were to go back, what I would enjoy doing is finding a lot of the Gutenberg elements that are already created and just focus heavily on changing the design versus so much custodability on our own end. Um, it's almost because we've made 50 something blocks at this point and we need everything to be so uniform, like so the same, it's, it's almost too difficult to go back and change all of that. But I really, really wish we would have gave a lot of native Gutenberg a chance at the very, very beginning. Yeah, and a lot of that problem was like, Gutenberg documentation has been few and far between. I mean, anyone in here that's building in it knows that like, it's really hard to find this information, which is why we gave you guys code snippets today. So hopefully you could take that away. Um, it's, it's just, it's been really hard. So we, even though we know these features are here, it's very hard to find those things. So go ahead. Uh, okay. You were talking about how this project is mainly for um, your users to have like a simple interface to go in. Um, maybe this is just my lack of experience talking, but one of the things I've struggled with with Gutenberg compared to kind of like a more old school custom fields approach is so you're building out this visual interface in the back end, but at the end of the day, it's not, it's good, it's pretty difficult to make it one to one to what you are going to see in the front end. So there's still at least in my experience, that additional preview step. Um, is that something that you guys struggle with at all in terms of like, you know, handing this off to like your content editors and your users? Um, you know, I'm especially thinking about things like sliders where like a lot of the content is not visible. So how do you build a backend interface for that um, in an intuitive way? It's cute because that was the exact example I was going to give. We do not, our slider functionality is not built into the back end. So one of the front end technologies we're using um, to build the website is Bootstrap. Um, so we are not enabling Bootstrap and that functionality on the back end. It's just the Bootstrap carousel. We're not doing that. 
Um, it's definitely hard, uh, especially because the preview that's in Gutenberg is what's showing in edit. And so they can think that that is what's being reflected on the front end. Um, and the problem is I don't really have any answers. It's been training to get people to understand that. It's still a common problem. Um, we're trying to add some more layers to the publishing process so people can actually like put this page up as a draft a little bit easier and make sure that it's not going out uh, public and sort of reinforcing that behavior because there are some draft things that already exist, but it, it's hard, um, especially when it's like a draft of a post that already exists. Um, so yeah, the problem is, is it's a problem, actually. <laughs> Um, I know we do, like she, like she said, we focus on a lot of training. Our biggest issue that I have noticed is, well, luckily most of our users, most of our content creators are using computers. So we're not having to worry about the mobile version of the front end and like making sure that they can design as the front end. So that has been my biggest notice is when they're trying to design it for mobile, especially like our blog, we don't have a very beautiful way to make sure that as they're building, it looks exactly like that. So that's a problem that we're gonna discover one day or a, a solution. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I saw someone over there, go ahead. <laughs> so at the first, hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. At the first session, uh, you talked about the uh, social media integration on the Disney Parks uh, blog. And I was curious, um, is that automated? Does a user have to go in and like somehow indicate a post is exists? Uh, how does it pull in the content? What design things did you think about when you integrated that with the blog? Yeah, so that's where our um, taxonomies came in handy. So what we do is we have each social media has its own post style, you know? So then as someone's creating, let's say they create a post, they're creating a post and they decide what they're doing is sharing a TikTok. So they'll choose the TikTok version. We have its own custom template that is made just for TikTok, made just for Instagram. And that's gonna show up on that side. Well, then it also, we have our template system that's going to show each card has its own design. And so what we're doing is on the front end, when we have a category page and all it's doing is showing all of our social links to that category, we are using a masonry that is pulling in all the files and doing a query loop that goes to that category. And then it's just displaying them all. So we have them customized everywhere and we're just pulling it in with the query loop. Um, we're currently working on a filter bar as well to make sure that we can filter through um, not only categories, but different sections and stuff, you know, basic stuff that we're catching up to so <laughs> and a little bit of clarity the way that you're doing all of those settings because they are complex is we are using advanced custom fields so like you would go to that post and when she's saying you have that template it's like a it's like a set of ACF right um, and that's kind of how we're guiding the user um, once again it's a wonderful interface where we can really kind of optimize that best UX so okay we got time for more Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you optimize performance using dynamic blocks? So this one's hard. <laughs> <laughs> sure, okay. <laughs> so once again, with our dynamic blocks, yes, it is, there's probably other performance things that we could do that's better. Um, but once again, to state that we focus on design first and everything else is secondary. That includes performance sometimes. Not that performance isn't important, but sometimes it takes a backseat. Um, so we negate this with different things like only allowing them to put so many things on a page before it changes over. But with the dynamic blocks, with the render, it pulls up the, like it does, it. Whatever, I don't know what it does on the back end, but it does something to where it turns it all into HTML on the server side. So the editor experience, things like that might be a little bit slower, but we don't care about that. And then it's pure HTML and it is faster on the front end for our visitors, which is what we care about. Our, our digital creators, they can deal with it being a little slow, but not our visitors. So I hope that answers your question. Sure. Uh, a question related to a previous question actually regarding the editor experience um, and I think design was touched upon but I had a question about the interactivity and if you had a philosophy about you know 
the admin experience. Um, I think, especially with inner blocks, if you have a wrapper for the inner blocks, do you handle everything in inspector controls, or you know, do you lock, do you kind of lock things down so that things, uh, you know, like the inner blocks don't have as many customizable options for end users, and yeah. Like yeah, so we are very heavily using inspector controls right now, and that's just because it's much easier for us to train that piece of knowledge into our users right now. They know every single time they click on a block, they click that block panel, and there's everything, right? The only thing that they affect on in the actual Gutenberg editor is their text. So any sort of visual setting they're gonna see, they're gonna see it on the right-hand side. They're gonna be able to go down bullet by bullet of what they have. Um, as far as kind of philosophies, we try to prioritize what's most important first. So you can see with a dynamic post block, we put the filter right up top, and then the, the format of the actual block itself second, and then visual settings last, because realistically, you don't actually have to tweak the visual settings. Um, and then grouping con similar content together um, with things like panel bodies and stuff like that. We do, because of how our components are built, we do have some of them that are coming in through, um, what is it, the block controls? I, for I forgot specifically what it's called. Um, but we've noticed, like for instance, if one of our components is an image upload that's specifically handling something behind the scenes, and um, that's why it's custom, and it uh, will come up in the menu bar and it'll be replace item and replace item and replace item because we're calling technically three components if there's three images it will appear on that front end to be a little bit confusing um, so we also try to use in place um, editing as much as possible um, when it's available to us so we do also yes lock down our inner blocks we yes yeah. yes yes well, yeah, and if you could also see, we like lock down like allowed formats in most places because um, things like, I mean, you can't italicize the text if we're not even calling that um, that font, right? Um, so, yeah. One more. Hi, it's me again. Hi. <laughs> uh, do you use um, for 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 your different sites? two-part question basically you use I assume you use multi-site for like Disney parks and your press sites and all that right yes so we use a combo so disneyconnect.com and if you actually go to that site and you open up that menu you can see that there's like a little sites tab that is every site that's available in that multi-site platform so the root site is Disney Connect, which is Disney Experiences, and then we have um, our public affairs, and we also have our press in there. Um, so different sites on the multi-site platform are actually running on different child themes. Um, Disney Parks Blog is its own site because um, it's massive, and then our internal platform is also a multi-site platform. It's it on top of the blocks. And no matter what site, you can go to that site and use common components throughout all your sites, right? Yes. Yeah. And then, yeah, sometimes we turn them off depending on what child theme you're in. So. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.